Well, hey, good morning, church. Um, if you want, uh, I would like you to turn to Haggai uh, chapter 1. And uh, I'm going to uh, start off and say what I said to the board Friday night. I had a meeting with them, and, and uh, some by person, some by phone as the gals were meeting here for their uh, Bible study, and uh, I was getting into some word, and God yesterday put a new word uh, on my heart for today, for the for the season, for the time that we're in, and as you know, uh, we are uh, we are living in, in uh, unexpected and, and unprecedented times, um, and uh, if you'd have told me a month ago that, that we are going to be uh, shutting down restaurants and stores and uh, many factories, uh, all these things would be shut down, and not only that, but we'd have travel pretty much banned, and and, and even today, I heard that we're, we may be uh, heading into a two-week two time where everything is going to be mandatorily shut down. And so we'll see. We'll keep you posted on, on the things that are uh, coming up and what that means for the church and where we're going. So, um, But with that said, it's a great day to be alive. And... Um, uh, as believers, uh, I believe the the prayers uh, we have been praying for so long are on the precipice of coming to pass. Uh, we do not need to fear, uh, however, because God is our refuge. He's our strength. Uh, he's our ever-present help in times of trouble. I think last week I accidentally said God's our trouble. God is not our trouble. He's our ever-present help in times of trouble. And so, praise God. Somebody pointed that out. Sometimes when you're up here, you say things and you said, did I really say that? Okay, but praise God. And uh, so he's not only that, but he's also our protector and our provider in a time where where our world is is facing some some crazy stuff. But uh, and he's and he's the other thing is he's sovereign and he's in control. And so we don't have to fear, uh, we don't have to worry. And so as you know, uh, a couple weeks ago I began a series on Sunday morning, and we are we call it we're calling it the Church at Ephesus. And uh, we're studying that book verse by verse, and we will uh, most likely continue that next week. Uh, but uh, like I said, Friday, I just felt God moving in a different direction for this message, and so I wanted to, um, I just wanted to be obedient, and uh, I got, got it done last night and crammed it right before today, before we got here. So um, I thank Chris uh, for coming in, and Scott, they're, we've been working on the sound, and we got that, I think, squared away. All the buzzing's gone for the most part. Praise God. Maybe you can hopefully hear me clearly. Uh, so, but uh, we're going to get into the book of Haggai, and uh, I think there's some important lessons that the Israelites uh, needed to learn and that we need to learn today as well uh, through that. And so I'm going to read from uh, Haggai chapter 1. We're going to read the first uh, nine verses. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. And this is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say, the time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house remains in ruin? Now, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much, but you have harvested little. You, you eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home I blew away. Why, declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house, which remains in ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And God, in these troubled times, we can find strength, we can find hope, we can find comfort, and we can find peace in your word. And so, Father, speak to our hearts this morning. Touch our lives and let us hear what the Spirit is saying uh, to us individually and to us as a church as we are uh, not meeting today and we are in our homes, <clears throat> wherever we may be. May the Spirit of the Lord uh, just touch us and anoint us and just be with us and, and do a special, extra, extra special work in our hearts and our lives uh, during this time when we're not meeting together as a body. Would you speak to us today, Lord? And we just ask these things today in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. 
Amen. Well, the book of Haggai was written uh, by him 2,500 years ago exactly. And, and I find that interesting uh, that it was exactly 25 years ago. Uh, we know that because uh, King Darius was in his second year. He was reigning in his second year, and we know uh, through the records when he, when he reigned. And so we know it was exactly 2,500 years ago. And uh, the reason that it is so interesting is that there are some similarities between Israel in 500 uh, BC and America today. And um, also interesting is that nine of those 12 minor prophets, uh, the last three, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and, and Malachi, lived and preached before Israel's captivity into Babylon. And uh, which we also refer to, of course, as the exile. And Haggai and Zechariah appear on the scene 18 years after the return of Israel when the temple had been previously destroyed in 586 B.C. by the armies of Babylon. And so here we come 40 years, eight years later, and Cyrus had allowed the Jews to go back and to return to their homeland to rebuild the temple. The temple was God's house, of course, and it was also a symbol of his presence. And so they set about to rebuild the temple right away. In fact, they began to build it and 23 days after Haggai, his first message, which is a short time. Uh, but then some things happen. Which brings me to my first point and my first question today, and it's this. What got in their way? Their main reason or purpose for going back to Jerusalem, uh, of course, was to rebuild the temple. But for starters, they ran into opposition. Have you ever ran into opposition? Well, it can cause two things to happen. And one is a greater determination than ever before to, to get the job done, to complete the task at hand. And uh, like we just had here with these speakers, I mean, you can either just let it go and just leave it alone, or you can just determine yourself to get that thing done, whatever it is that you want to accomplish. And we see that in Nehemiah. Uh, they had faced a lot of opposition, but it didn't stop them. It didn't even slow them down, really. Uh, they, just, they just kept going going and and uh, the wall was amazingly built in 52 days not the case here when they're rebuilding the temple not at all once they faced opposition uh, from the outside forces the work completely stopped let me say this before we move on. If you're going to be doing a significant work uh, for God, especially things for the Lord, you're going to face opposition. That's, that's a given. And uh, what you do, though, with that opposition makes all the difference in the world. That's the big thing. And uh, what happened was the uh, first company of Jews who, who returned to Jerusalem, uh, they laid the foundation for the new temple in 536 B.C. with great excitement and great expectation. They, they had their you know, hearts set on, you know, they were going to go after it and they were going to do this and, and they, were, they were ready to go. But as a result of the neighboring people who began to oppose them and what they were doing, uh, they became discouraged. And they, the building project stopped in 534 B.C., which is two years later. I know it's different when you're talking B.C., but it's actually later. Uh, only two short years after they began uh, the building process. They quickly forgot their purpose. Uh, they lost their priorities. Uh, disinterest it began to set in. And, of course, with disinterest, of course, apathy took over, and that began to set in. And uh, so much so that they abandoned the building for over 15 years. I think nearly 16 years they abandoned the rebuilding process. And so what have you done? Uh, my question is when you've faced opposition with the dream that God has put upon your heart, have you gotten discouraged and distracted and allowed apathy to set in? Or have you fought through and got it to yourself to the other side of that thing? Big difference if you keep fighting through or if you just say, ah, you just let apathy uh, just settle in and, and, and forget the whole thing and kind of abandon it. Well, you know, I think of America and I think how we started out so strong. And uh, the goal of our founding fathers was to flee the government um, 
sanctioned Church of England, and that everyone, of course, was forced to be a part of that, that church. And so these, these men came to our shores. They were looking to establish a government uh, based on God's word where the people could have freedom of religion, freedom of speech. Uh, they, they, could have, they would have all sorts of freedom. And uh, when you think about it, our universities taught from the book, and the only book they taught from was the Bible. Amen. The co Constitution was written based upon God's word. And scripture was uh, ingrained in all of our buildings in Washington. Uh, so there was, a, there was a, uh, a desire by these guys to go after God and to have freedom to worship and, and to go and, and seek God with all their heart. But over time, opposition has come and is coming stronger all the time from an ever secularized atheistic people to abandon these godly principles and God's word. And the question I have for us as Christians is, will we put up a spiritual fight and stand strong against the forces of darkness? Or will we allow the forces of the darkness to, to continue to take apart what God has ultimately put in place through these men and these women? Will this opposition cause us to be discouraged and distracted and become apathetic? Well, I said apathetic, ap you know, become a, uh, like apathy, which is apathetic. It's really the same thing. Uh, that we abandon the good fight of faith, or will we continue to build? Will we continue to, continue to move forward in the things that God has for us? Do we still have a holy, reverent awe and fear of God, or are we be, being hijacked by a fear of man? Big difference there, too. Fear is running rampant in our nation right now, as we know, as we've seen as this whole uh, virus has come about. Fear is just continuing to run rampant. Um, and, and the question is, are we going to succumb to that fear? If we are, I believe, as Christians, we are sinning. Because God didn't give us that spirit. That spirit didn't come from God. It came from the enemy. We know that. In 2 Timothy 1.7, we know it says that. Um, I've never counted it, but I'm told that there is, uh, it says not to fear 365 times in the Bible. And if that number is true, it gives us not one day that we're to be in fear. If you, if you, you know, put, put that out into the whole year. If anything, we should be just the opposite. And uh, our light should shine brighter than ever before with joy. And we should have confidence and peace and boldness in these days. Because he is our refuge and he is our strength and he is our ever-present help in times of trouble. Hallelujah. And so, um, if we will keep building on the foundation of our faith, which of course is Christ Jesus, we have nothing to fear because God will be with us each step of the way. Praise God. And that leads me to my next question in, in uh, point number two. Whose house are you building? Your own or God's? And the Lord speaks through the prophet Haggai and says to Zerubbabel, the governor of Judah, and Joshua, the high priest, he says this. He says, is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your paneled houses while this house, he's referring to his own house, remains in ruin? The verse before that, uh, chapter 1, verse 2, Haggai tells them what the Lord says about what the people were saying and what were they saying. The time has not yet come for the Lord's house to be built. I just mentioned uh, what, I, what's, what uh, started their drift away from building God's temple. Uh, the opposing forces w w was the factor which led them from focusing on the works uh, of God and uh, to, to focusing. What happened was they took their focus off the works of God and they put it on their own desires and their own houses and their own things. See, but buildings, building God's house took a back seat because now they were building their own nice homes in their suburbs with their nice built-in pool, with their three-car garage, their underground sprinklers. They were, they were taking care of all the things that they wanted to get done and they wanted to do. Okay, maybe I added a few things there. I obviously did, but you get the point. God was no longer the priority. And they had become the priority in their own lives. And uh, their priorities got a bit confused. And I know sometimes that can happen to us, but we just got to get back on track and get focused when that happens. And so, but the temple was a, a symbol of Judah's relationship with God. And the fact that it was neglected and unfinished spoke volumes about uh, their relationship and their spiritual condition and their relationship with God. It spoke many volumes of where they were at spiritually. 
And a good question for all of us to ask at this juncture in life is, is that with all that is going on, do I have any unfinished business with God that he's called me to do and that I'm not doing? Lord, is there anything I should be doing that you've called me to do or, you know, I'm not doing? I need to know that, Lord. I think God is trying to get our attention right now, and that is why he's allowing everything to come to a halt. Us Americans like to rush here and rush there, and it seems like the pace gets getting, I don't know about you, but it seems like it's getting faster and faster all the time. Try going the speed limit on the highway one time. <clears throat> Just try it. Your fellow Americans will let you know real quick that going slow is unacceptable. Either by horn or by riding your bumper or showing you their IQ, but one way or another, they're going to show you that that's un unacceptable. As they pass you in disgust, they're going to show you that. Unless we think we're so holy, be, be careful. I know at times I have been the one in a hurry and have showed my displeasure for the person in front of me who's driving uh, in peace. How dare they get in my way? How dare they get slow, pokey Pete? Get out of the way and get moving, you know? Now, <laughs> now, God has sanctified me in that I'm not displaying my IQ anymore when, I, when that happens. But how holy is it if I'm still impatient, if I'm still angry, if I'm still showing my displeasure in other ways? How, how good is that? How, how holy is that? That wasn't going to be a part of my message, but I thought uh, we'll just throw that in there for no extra charge. And maybe that was for someone else besides me. I don't know. But... But I think when we rush around and tell everyone how busy we are, as if it's some kind of badge of honor that we wear, uh, it's, it's something about our great character, are we just avoiding who we really are and what God is really wanting to do in our hearts? Often we're running from the deep work that God's looking to do in us, building our outward temples while neglecting the temple of God and what he wants to do in us. And that's so important. It's, that's what's important is what are you wanting to do in us, God? And I think as we have this time, um, you know, as we have this time off, and it looks like we're going to have a really slow pace. I think my pace, I know, is about to drop off probably after tomorrow. We may come here and do a couple more messages for maybe the next week or two. But when, when that pace drops off, that, that's a great time for us to kind of reflect and say, okay, God, where am I at? Do an inventory. Where am I going? And what are you, what are you asking of me? What, am I, where, where, what does it look like in the future? And so uh, we have that pause, and I would just encourage us, encourage us, churches, we're not meeting in the house of God. Let's just get before God in our living rooms and wherever and just say, God, or in our prayer rooms, even better yet, in our homes, and let's say, God, what do you want to do in me? What are you speaking to me? What are you showing me? What are you showing the nation as a whole? Because, uh, Lord, we want to we wanna move forward in the things of God. We want to see a country one for Jesus. But the Jewish people <clears throat> turned their focus completely away from spiritual goals, and instead toward their own personal desires and needs. I know I've done that. I think we've all done that at times. We get off the focus. We get, ourself, we get our focus on ourselves. But the harder they work for themselves, the less they had because they completely ignored their spiritual lives. And that's not good. See, if we put him first, our deepest desires and needs will be met. If we don't, our efforts are going to be futile. And they had lost God's blessing because their lives were so focused on their own self-centeredness, their own selfishness. That's all they were thinking about. That's why he says to them in verse 6, You have planted much, but it har have harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes, but are never warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. Doesn't sound very good, does it? And he continues two verses later. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. And he even, he even withheld the dew, and, he, and there, a drought came on the land because of, because of their, their obedience or lack of obedience and the way they were behaving. And so the Lord answers why that's so in the next verse. He says, because my house, which remains in, ru in ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. 
And you know, I think uh, we've got to get our eyes off ourselves and once again get our eyes back on God. I think, he, I think if, we have, if we do that in this pause of these however many weeks it's going to be, I believe we're going to see an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. I'm looking forward in the days ahead what God's going to do. If we'll just step back as a church, step back as people of God and just allow God to do what He wants to do in us and be the, be the church. God always starts in the house of God dealing with us first before He deals with the world. And so let's allow God to do the work he wants to do within us in these couple of weeks. Hallelujah. So God is allowing us to be slowed down so that we can get busy about the Father's business. Hallelujah. Building his house. Amen. One brick at a time. That's how it happens. And so my, my, my plea is if there's any unfinished business with God, now is the time to begin to make it right. And five times in these two chapters, the Lord says, Give careful thought to your ways. Interesting, five times in two chapters, and when the Lord repeats things, I've said it before, but when he repeats things over and over, he's trying to get our attention and say, hey, listen to this, be careful. You know, he's telling them, be careful. Give careful thought to your ways. And uh, that's very important, no matter what we're doing in life, to give careful thought to our ways. And the Lord tells them in verse 8, Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build the house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Well, we see in this verse that God will provide the resources, but he needs obedient people to do the work. He's not doing the work. He's calling us to do the work, and he'll, he'll, he will provide as he's provided here. All right, let's go on to number three. What happens when you obey? Well, God says four words to them in verse 13 that sums it up, I think. And he says this, I am with you. <laughs> That's pretty simple, but it's pretty powerful too. I am with you. That's good enough for me. That alone should make me want to obey. And because of their obedience, God gave them the strength and the determination to accomplish the work that was ahead of them. He tells them they don't have to fear because his spirit was with them. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you don't have to fear. In fact, you shouldn't fear the coronavirus. You shouldn't fear uh, cancer, heart disease, uh, anything else. You don't have to fear. Why? Because God is with you. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Let the name of the Lord be praised. You're not going anywhere unless God says you're going somewhere. And lights are out, okay? You're not going anywhere. And even if you do go somewhere, you're going to a better place, so it's all good anyway. Hallelujah. So how many of you know that even when you uh, obey, uh, you know, when you obey God, there's going to be discouragement, there's going to be distractions that are going to come. Uh, I mean, the temple had been destroyed for uh, over 70 years. Or 70 years earlier, it had been destroyed that long. And some of those that had been living uh, had seen the splendor of the holiness of the temple. Uh, they had seen it before, and uh, now they're seeing that the new temple that they're putting up, and they're going, ooh, 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 not as near as nice. This is kind of junky. This isn't very nice temple. So they became disheartened, and and they became discouraged. And uh, those people were children back in that day, and they remembered uh, Solomon's temple with all of its splendor and uh, how it was overlaid with gold and, and had precious stones. And they remembered the pillars. And, oh, yeah, what about the precious porch? And, and all the, as we would say today, the whistles and bells that had it all, that, that, that Solomon's temple, you know, I, I want to see it like Solomon. I remember Solomon's temple. I want to see it like it was yesterday. That was so beautiful and it was so good. And in their minds, all had been lost when they were building this new temple. But there are always things that will come along that will try to derail us, especially when we're obeying God and doing His will. So those older folks should have known better that they needed to keep their eyes on the prize, Jesus Christ. Instead, they forgot. Or they just, I don't know, they were neglectful. Who knows what they did, but I think they kind of forgot. See, because it's not about the beauty, it's not about the design of the church building that determines what God is going to do in this place or any other place. 
the only thing that will have lasting spiritual impact is going to be that is that it, it, we have to have our in our congregations is is really what we need is God's presence. And uh, if we've got God's presence uh, through the gifts and the ministries of the power of the Holy Spirit, that's all we need. Amen. Completed. Done. Without it. All we have here is a social club, regardless of how nice our building is, regardless of how great these stainless stained glass is. If the presence of God isn't here, it's not happening. You look at Europe, there's all these beautiful uh, stained glass old buildings and churches, and now they're nothing but museums and mausoleums, and they're just death because the Spirit of God left the house and there's nothing left. And so we've got to have the Spirit of God. It's not about our beautiful buildings. And yes, we come and we thank God for this beautiful building, but we we don't worship this building, and we know that. And, and we worship God from from our hearts, and He's in us. We're the temple, of course. And so, praise God. So, the Lord knew what the response would be of all those who saw the former temple. So, He encourages the people with three promises uh, through the prophet Haggai in chapter 2. First, he, says, he, he lets, lets them know that God himself would be with them to fulfill all the promises made to their ancestors. That's a good feeling. That's a feeling of comfort. He's gonna, God's going to fulfill those promises he made to our ancestors. Second, his spirit would re remain among the people. Ah, that's good too. That's really good, and that's comforting. And then third, the glory of God's house in the future would be greater than anything in the past. Hallelujah. And the reason that was spoken was because of the powerful things that would eventually take place in the temple. And they were no small things, I'll say, including, of course, in that was the ministry of Jesus and his followers as they are recorded in the Gospels in the book of Acts. And so we know that uh, Jesus himself, 500 years later, eventually would enter the temple when he was on earth and he would be bringing God's presence there in a, in a, in a sense, literally, and in a powerful way than ever had ever happened before. And... Think about it. He was presented there uh, as an infant on the eighth day as they did the circumcision. He was presented there uh, at 12, 12 years old. He goes there and he's, he's talking with all the you know rabbis and teachers of the law and all those guys. Uh, when it was the Passover, remember, and his parents left him and they came back for him. He's already got a lot of wisdom and, of course, and, and all that. And his mom says, hey, what are you doing here? I must be about my father's business. And she didn't really understand what in the world he was talking about. But God's already all over him and upon him. And then we know as an adult, he preached and did miracles there as well. So we know that this temple, great things are going to happen in this temple that didn't happen in Solomon's temple, as beautiful as it was with all of its overlaid gold and the rest of it. But, it, but this temple, great things were going to happen. And God had greater things in store, spiritually speaking. Yeah. And, and in the end, those things cannot be destroyed like brick or mortar. Those spiritual things will last. Uh, the brick and mortar, it can all go crumbling down, but, but the things of God will last, and that's what, we, that's what we long for and live for as Christians. So. But let me just say this before we move on. <clears throat> it's never healthy to do comparisons especially with other people. There's always somebody that's going to be prettier, uh, sexier, more handsome, more successful than you or than me. It's always going to be that person out there. It's not all healthy for me as a pastor to, to do comparisons to other pastors. Not good. Or us as a church to compare ourselves with other churches. It, it's just not healthy. And, and why? Because here's what I would say. What appears on the outside is rarely reflective of what God is doing on the inside of people's hearts and what he's doing on the inside of that church and what he's going to do in that church or in somebody for years ahead down the road. And so we can't see what God is preparing now on the inside and what will have that impact maybe 10 years later, 100 years later, 1,000 years later. We don't know what God's doing. And so we can't, we can't judge that. And so I would just encourage us not to do comparisons. It only brings us down and it just it causes trouble in our hearts and in our spirits. So number four, what is God shaking? Well, chapter 2, verse 6. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In a little while, I will once more shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake the nations and, and the desire of all the nations will come. And I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord Almighty. 
I've been on this earth for 60 years, and what is happening now has never happened in my lifetime. It's never occurred. I've never seen such a thing before. I think one of my kids was kind of surprised, but I thought, no, this is not a normal thing. This doesn't happen every decade. And yes, we've had some small things with maybe measles and you know all of those years past, but, but it's never been to this extent with this global world that we're living in with all the communication. It gets there quickly. We find out about it quickly, but so many people travel, and next thing you know, we're all we're really all one big uh, neighborhood, if you will, now compared to what we used to be. And so it's a different, it's a different day. And so this is a different uh, scene that we've never seen before. And, uh, but there seems to be a shaking. There seems to be a shifting going on. And I believe the Lord is trying to get our attention. When he says he will once more shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, he's referring to when Christ's kingdom will be set up in this world. God is going to do similar, similar things for his church as he did for them, the Israelites, when he brought them out of Egypt. He shook the heavens and the earth at Mount Sinai. And also, when Christ was born, Herod and all of Jerusalem were troubled. And we know the Bible says he caused the falling and the rising of many. So there was, there was a shaking going on there. And, um, but when God promised to shake all nations with his judgment, he was uh, speaking of present judgments of, of evil nations plus future judgments in the last days. And um, the prophet Joel said it this way. The Lord will roar from Zion and thunder from Jerusalem. The earth and the sky will tremble, but the Lord will be a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. Hebrews 12, 26 and 27 states it this way. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised once more, I will not only shake the earth, but also the heavens. See, the only thing that is going to survive as it is presently at the end of time is the kingdom of God and those who belong to it. That's the only thing that's not going to be shaken. The rest of all this stuff, the church is going to be shaken. It, it's, 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 not, it's going to be shaken. And so if people don't have Christ, that's a shaky spot to be at, no pun intended. But we want to be in, in the Lord and in, in, in his business uh, when, when, these, when these end times come. And I believe they're coming quickly. And uh, so myself, along with others, we've been praying uh, for last day's outpouring, a last day's revival, uh, a great move of God where many people would come to Christ or many people would come back to the Lord and get to know him as their personal Savior in, in Lord. And I've often thought, what's it going to take for people to come to Christ? To come or to come back to Christ. I look around me and I see people are so comfortable and so set in their ways. They've got their 401ks, they've got their house, they've got their cars, they've got their, they're, they're now re getting retired. Even around my neighborhood, people are getting retired left and right and they've, they've got everything they need. And so why do I need Jesus? Why do I need something more? Don't I have what, uh, haven't I lived the American dream? Haven't I got everything I need? Well, I'm going to tell you, no, you don't. Because the greatest thing you need is heaven. The greatest thing you need is Jesus. Jesus, and he's the one that can get you to heaven. And so that's the greatest need you have. That's the greatest need I have is, is Jesus Christ and, and to know him and to live for him in these last days because times are going to get troublesome and we need to live for him in these last days. And uh, he is the answer. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father except through him. So could this coronavirus be a part of the shaking of the nations? I don't know for sure, but it very well could be. I have a feeling God's going to wake, open up some eyes and, and uh, open up some hearts through this. And so I do know this. If you have never surrendered your life to Jesus Christ or have walked away, he's calling you to come home today. He's knocking at your door. It's time to come home. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. I also know this. Once you've given your life to Christ, you will not be shaken. I have had no fear of the coronavirus. Why? Well, because I know where I'm going when I die. And quite frankly, I've known where I've gone since the spring of 1985 when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. When I accepted as my, him as my Savior, I've known ever since then that where I'm going when I die is to heaven. I've had that assurance. And I'll be in an, heaven in eternity with Jesus forever. And you can be assured of that very thing too, of going there. And, uh, and today is the day of salvation, the Bible says. And so if that's your desire, I'm just going to ask,
ask you to pray this prayer with me. And uh, wherever you are, you might be at home in your living room, you might be, I don't know, in the car, you might be doing something, I don't know. Uh, but all I know is I'm going to ask you, if you just, you know, you may have known about, or heard about God, but if you don't know Him as your personal Savior, you can know Him. And in these troubled times, you can have peace. And you can have joy. And you can have confidence. Because when, when, when Jesus Christ comes in, it changes everything. And so, I'm just going to ask you to just, where you're at, just pray this simple prayer with me. And uh, after I pray it, and uh, here we go. Let's, let's do that together. Dear Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Come into my heart and life. Be my Savior and my Lord. Make me new in you. Amen and amen. And I just want to say, if that's you and you, you are watching this, this might be the Sunday that this is going out, which is, uh, what, March 15th of uh, uh, 2020. This might be four years later. I don't know when you're watching this, but it applies every day, whatever you're watching this. And if you did that, uh, welcome to the family of God. The, the Bible says when one, one comes to heaven, all of uh, all the angels in heaven rejoice. And so when one comes to the Lord, and so they're rejoicing in heaven over your, your decision to come to Jesus Christ today. And so thank you for that. And I uh, just want to say God bless you. And uh, you can, uh, if that's you and you, you want us to a follow up, we can give you a follow up. We do have a booklet called um, Brand New. And it's a, a booklet I wrote years ago. And it just gives you a kind of a 30 day devotional to how you can go from here in your new walk with God. And uh, if you would get a hold of us, uh, you can get a hold of us at the church at 616-942-6320. Or just uh, get a hold of us on our on our um, uh, website or our or uh, email anyway the other ways anyway call us and we'll give you that information so anyway god bless you guys hey thanks for listening and and church will keep you posted as far as what's coming up in the days ahead uh there could be some more changes and i will i will definitely keep you posted but keep the faith stay strong and uh just go after god in these uh days where we're not meeting uh for you know it could be a couple it could be three weeks or it could be longer i don't know but go hard after god and keep up the keep the fighting the good fight of faith amen